Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the NJCU EdTech Doctoral Spring Webinar Series. My name is Melissa Wells, and I'm one of your hosts this evening. So I'm currently a doctoral student in Cohort 10 in our EdTech Leadership EDD program. And I'm also the graduate assistant of our EdTech department here at NJCU as well. So I'm so delighted to kick off this exciting session about artificial intelligence. I feel like everyone's talking about that nowadays. So over the next few weeks, we have an incredible lineup of educators, experts, and researchers who are going to share the latest developments, opportunities, and challenges surrounding the use of AI in education and about everywhere else. So from adaptive learning systems to intelligent tutoring, conversational agents, and more, AI is going to open up new possibilities to enhance student outcomes, expand access to learning, and support educators. Now, throughout these sessions, we're going to explore several key topics. So there will be time for questions and answers at the end. So during the session, please feel free to comment or ask a question in the chat box below. Uh, you guys can also, uh, you know, tell us where you're from, what state, uh, what school district you're from. Uh, the, the better you interact with us, um, the much more it's going to be so much interesting. So again, um, all questions will be answered towards the end. So these sessions are going to provide a platform for AI complex issues and inspire thoughtful debate on how to best leverage AI to create more effective and human-centered learning experiences. So we have such a diverse community of leading minds and educators gathered here today. I see that. And I encourage, again, everyone to be active participants so that we all learn from each other. So as you know, the future of education will surely be shaped by AI. So together, let's learn about these solutions on how to direct these technologies towards empowering students and once again, educators. So everyone, thank you for being here today. And I look forward to the educational discussions that we're gonna have ahead. Now, I know before I introduce our presenter for this evening, cause I know we're all excited. I'm gonna introduce you to Dr. Dana Mason and she's gonna be speaking about our department and what we offer here at NJCU. Awesome, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, before we begin, I'm just gonna take a minute or two to share a little bit of information. Um, so my name is Dr. Dana Mason and I am a professional support specialist for the educational technology department, as well as um, an adjunct professor. So I'm excited to be here with you guys this evening and I'm just so happy y'all can be here and um, be part of this AI webinar series. Um, our program is really interesting. Um, we are nationally recognized. We have um, our, the educational technology department at NJCU is first uh, recognized. NJC nationally. City University. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Thank you so much for, for asking. It's uh, New Jersey City University. That's correct. So um, it's, uh, so we are nationally recognized, recognized in the nation. and the MA program for our master's program is recognized third nationally as an online program. We also have our educational doctorate program, EDD, and um, we're recognized ninth nationally for affordability and the return on investment. So it's a really wonderful program of great people and a lot of quality um, for a great cost. So I'm just gonna show a little more information about some of the other things we offer. So in our degree program, we have a master's of education in educational technology which is 36 credits and fully online program. That's great too, because although you do receive a lot of support, it's asynchronous and convenient. Um, the other degree we offer is the MA in Educational Technology, specialization in school library media science. And so this is great because uh, it's also a 36 credits fully online. Um, there are a lot of um, school districts that are looking for librarians for their schools. And so we offer a great program that will help you get started and make sure that we have, um, you can even get started in a lot of those types of jobs with an emergency certification, as long as you're enrolled in the program. So if you have questions, you could always let us know. Um, we also have our educational doctor program. And uh, this is a 60 credit program, three years um, online with, um, we only have one week in person. Everything else is completely online. The uh, in-person week happens in the summer for Summer Institute. And that's great because there's a lot of great fun that we do. And it's a nice opportunity for people to work together. So you continue to develop that support that carries you through the rest of the year. And of course, um, not everyone's looking to go for a degree immediately. There are some other 
um, opportunities that we have as well. Some people are looking for higher attainment within their um, their district. So we offer different types of certificate programs that will support as well. So assistive technology is a really popular one. And um, this is a one year fully online program. It's five courses. So it gives you 15 credits total. There are three courses that are transferable to the MA program as well. So a lot of that's really exciting because certain classes you can take with one and add on the extras to obtain your assistive uh, technology certificate. We also have our STEM certificate and this is a four credit program, 12, cre um, sorry, four course program, 12 credits total. And these are also, some of them are transferable with the MA program that we have for the degree programs. So if you have any questions, I'll make sure I put our website in and our contact information in the chat, but it's also below. So feel free to take a picture if you'd like. Um, and thank you again so much. I'm gonna turn it back over to Melissa so we can get started without further ado. Thank you, Dana. All right, so now allow me to introduce our speaker for the evening. So our presenter this evening is Jeffrey Cantillo. Jeff holds the position of Departmental IT Manager at Princeton University. He leads their department with much focus on aligning IT initiatives with the institution's research and scholarly objectives. Now, as a lecturer, Jeffrey imparts knowledge in the field of IT accessibility, advocating for a more inclusive world, both in and out of the classroom. Additionally, he has written for and spoken at higher EDIT conferences on the topics of accessibility and inclusion. Holding his certified professional and accessibility core concepts, he has also been asked to develop a workshop on UDL for his colleagues, bringing to the educational technology field a wealth of experience while offering an articulate and informed perspective on the potential of AI to transform educational practices. He's also in our doctoral program here at NJCU. He's in cohort 10, and I'm so thrilled to know him for two years. He's an amazing person, and whenever the cohort has questions, we always go to him for technology. <laughs> I had to put that in there, Jeff. All right, so now without further ado, here is our presenter for the evening. Take it away, Jeff. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so yeah, uh, like Melissa said, uh, my name is Jeffrey Contio. Uh, I use he/him pronouns, and uh, she kind of went through my my top line resume for me. So that makes life a little easier for me, at least. Um, uh, uh, you know, to kind of dive into it, I have a wide range of interests. Um, focusing mainly in this section and, and on this topic is going to be, you know, education technology, which kind of fits into um, you know both our degree and our topic for this evening. Um, as well as AI and education specifically. Um, and like she mentioned, UDL or Universal Design for Learning. Um, you know, it comes to accessibility and that is kind of high level for what I do um, and also my interests. Um, you know, I am a, I also volunteer with a guide dog school based out of uh, Morristown, New Jersey here. Um, and uh, as of right now, I am also half of a therapy, cert a therapy dog team with one of my, with my career change dog from them uh, named Bobka. Um, and, you know, uh, to kind of dive into this topic today, we're going to talk about, you know, AI education. Um, my plan is to kind of look at it as a kind of an echo to the past and how we looked at technology in the past, how it's affected education in the past, and kind of use that as a um, guide with this new emerging technology. Um, I wanted to start with a uh, obligatory slide of my dog, Bobka, uh, because I always get asked about her. Um, so yeah, and she's in the room with, with me. So if you hear any whining, it's probably her and I apologize. Um, but yeah, so, uh, kind of go over our plan for, for this evening. Um, introductions are done. Um, Melissa took care of the majority of that for me. So thank you again, Melissa. Um, I'm going to kind of look at the historical perspectives of technology and how it has changed, um, education as it's come in and kind of disrupted things, um, Look at AI's influence on the dynamic of teaching and learning. Uh, we're going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, you know pedagogy in regards to digital literacy um, and equity uh, in the age of AI. Um, look at some of those practical uh, integrations of AI into the ed educational framework as kind of a look forward. And then we'll have some time for some questions and answers and chats discussions at the end. Um, by all means, toss questions like they mentioned in the chat as we go along. Um, and, you know, if it's relevant, if it's kind of like clarification wise, we'll kind of deal with it in time. Um, but for the most part, we'll probably save a lot of those for the end for our little discussion portion, um, as long as we're all okay with that. So 
Um, to start off, let's look at these historical perspectives. So my headcanon in regards to how um, uh, uh, AI is kind of shaking things up, that this really isn't new. Um, you know, Mark Twain is often credited uh, with the idea that history doesn't really repeat itself, but often rhymes. So when I look at that and I kind of think about that, uh, what this means to me is, you know, while details, circumstances, settings, names, these things may change, similar events will essentially recycle. So we take that idea and kind of look back at those past technologies, the challenges that they have created and the challenges that they've had themselves into bringing their way into the classroom. Um, there's always going to be some sort of that initial resistance, uh, which eventually does lead to some level of acceptance into the classroom. So is there a pattern? I would say so. Look at calculators. How many times were you told you had to memorize times tables. I have this like rote memory in the back of my head of sitting in my math class and in, in uh, it was like seventh grade and I couldn't move on in my lecture until I got through all the times tables in a certain time period um, because I wasn't gonna have a calculator in my pocket all the time. Or, you know, you're, you, you should be at least a basic level understanding of these specific topics because it's not like you're gonna have access to the to an, an encyclopedia to look this up later or you're gonna have to have you know perfect penmanship because you're not going to be able to you know type it out all the time right um you know right now if you look at it you know with our smartphones and you know our, our tablets are getting smaller um, and then bigger and then smaller again uh, we all have those calculators we all have that computer we have the internet in our pocket at all times now, um, for the most part, you know, even Wikipedia, uh, when that first came out, it was the um, the thing that everybody made fun of, right? It was the garbage pile of the internet where anybody could put whatever they wanted. As it got built out and as it developed more, um, a lot of times you can, you know, I've seen and I've even used myself, if I'm honest, I've used Wikipedia as a way to then track down other sources, right? Use that to find something else. Scroll, I barely read the text half the time and I go down to the, the references at the base. So um, as we're talking about um, integration uh, now with something like as big as AI, it's important that we look back first and then kind of learn from those past, I'm not gonna call them mistakes, but past uh, um, uh, missteps. So, AI's influence is obviously multifaceted. It touches on personalized learning. Um, you know, it can touch on engagement, you know, assessment, um, you know, teacher and student collaboration. Um, and in a lot of cases, and in some research has already demonstrated its ability to modernize teaching techniques, uh, particularly in regards to uh, customizing those learning paths, you know, providing that personalized feedback. Um, uh, and overall, these things have shown to enhance student engagement. Um, and it actually allows teachers to tailor their instruction to the needs of their students, which is really important, um, including those who may have accessibility needs um, uh, by providing some real-time assessment um, and you know, ideas and recommendations for real-time interventions. Uh, AI in education obviously is not without its challenges, right? Um, you know, we have to worry about data privacy. We have to worry about biases in any AI algorithms. You know, an algorithm is made by a person and people have biases and those kind of make their way into the algorithm, into the code. Um, you know, we have to provide uh, uh, um, proper training for our teachers in order to use these AI tools effectively. Um, obviously there's concern for possible misuse of AI, not only by students, but by faculty and staff as well. Um, so I wanted to take a, I, I, I took a quick look at a, just a few re, uh, um, uh, uh, studies that were done. Um, you know, if you look at uh, Zhang and Aslan in, you know, just you know, 2000, uh, 2021, they, they mentioned that, or they found that there was some great potential in AI, uh, great potential for AI in education um, as a way to increase access to learning opportunities um, and scale up those personalized, personally customized learning experiences. Um, I found ways to optimize uh, methods and strategies to, to kind of enhance those learning outcomes. Um, another one is uh, Seattle Dahl and in, in, in 2021 uh, mentioned that AI systems uh, have already been uh, acknowledged to enhance both the quantity and quality of communication and education. Obviously, you know, it's not always gonna be the case. Quality is gonna come sometimes uh, 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 falter when quantity expands, but as these uh, generative models uh, advance, that'll get better. Um, uh, so 
providing these personalized providing personalized support in these larger scale settings. Um, you know, we think of larger school systems, larger education systems. Um, uh, it also improves the feeling of connection among those among learners themselves. Um, will these enhancements will uh, uh, these enhancements again will bring forward concerns regarding responsibility, uh, in regards to agency, and then surveillance within the education system too. Who has access to this data? Who's going to you know use it? Is it going to be for nefarious purposes? Um, you know, and, and in a more recent one, um, you know, with uh, Compton and Burke just uh, last April, uh, they found a rapid rise in AI. Uh, uh, in AI education, specifically in the higher education um, uh, realm uh, since 2020, uh, specifically focusing on um, assessment and evaluation, um, intervention predictions, AI assistance, um, uh, uh, and intelligent tutoring systems. So uh, collectively, these things suggest that AI has, can have, I should say, a positive impact on various aspects of learning outcomes. Um, it's going to take a lot of work on the back end, but that's kind of what we're here for, right? Um, you know, we, you know, there's a great opportunity for um, uh, uh, better academic performances, better communication, more student engagement. Um, but again, with a positive, we're going to have some negatives. Um, there are valid concerns and some valid challenges that need to be addressed uh, in a responsible and equitable way. So. If you look, all these studies were done um, and looked at 2022 and prior. Uh, ChatGPT rolled out in the fall of 2022. So obviously these are still new, or these are, even in this context, these are pretty old. So, you know, research is still on its way, research is still coming in. So, you know, uh, uh, we have to keep an open mind as we kind of advance forward. So when we're looking at you know digital literacy, pedagogy, and the likes um, in the age of AI, because we are in the age of AI as it is, um, you know AI is going to continue to reshape the educational landscape. Um, it's going to demand a shift in our teaching approaches. I mean, it already has. Um, it's not just about integrating AI tools, but a lot of times it's going to be rethinking how we teach. And a lot of teachers have already done this, and they've done a really great job of. Um, not only finding ways around, but finding ways to uh, use AI in their classrooms. Uh, AI opens the door to you know more constructivist learning idea uh, um, paths where students are more uh, uh, engaged in learning by doing and exploring. Excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, you know, a perfect example is, you know, you could use AI during simulations to allow students to experiment and learn from the outcomes in real time. Um, uh, uh, it's kind of, in this case, it's going to be more about, um, you know, guiding uh, discovery and nurturing those problem-solving skills. Uh, equally important is, you know, digital literacy, especially in regards to AI, um, uh, mostly for our educators. Um, it's essential to that our teachers really understand how to effectively use AI, integrate AI into their classrooms, um, and how to kind of approach the conversation of it um, with their students. Um, this is obviously going to include professional development. Um, it's going to include um, uh, uh, workshops and, and the likes uh, to kind of um, uh, focus on bringing AI and kind of look at the potential um, uh, advancements or the potential to use them um, and uh, their ethical use in the classroom itself. Uh, and as we continue to move on and, and, and kind of barrel through this AI-driven world, um, being digital literate uh, uh, means honestly understanding how AI works, its capabilities, and its social implications. Um, and as AI makes its way into our programs, um, we need to teach students those critical skills in regards to, you know, data literacy, uh, in regards to online safety, and, you know, an, an ethical technology use. Um, it's kind of, in this case, uh, uh, our, we were kind of su somewhat surprised when AI came out, so we didn't really have a chance to prepare them for the use. So now we're kind of playing catch up, but that's okay. Um, you know, it's it's going to be about um, understanding its impact uh, going forward, obviously. Um, so for developers, 
obviously I'm talking more to teachers, but for developers and those, uh, uh, it's going to mean um, kind of finding ways to design inclusive AI tools to cater to the diverse needs of learners, um, which that's where we come in as educators or people in the education field. We have to be the 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 uh, loudspeaker that kind of helps direct our AI developers um, to find better ways to, um, to 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 kind of focus their developmental fo uh, 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 line of sight onto better ways to bring it into the classroom. So looking at the actual like integration, like practical integration of AI, um, kind of let that look forward, right? Um, obviously it's gonna be a lot of training. Training for educators, training for staff, training for everybody involved, uh, you know, all those stakeholders. Um, our educators really need to receive comprehensive training in AI tools, you know, algorithms, understanding their use um, and kind of their approach um, and their application in curriculum itself. Um, this is going to take the place of, you know, workshops, seminars, online resources are going to be vital for this, um, you know, workshops and and like this, um, or webinars like this, sorry. Um, uh, uh, AI-driven curriculum design is going to be, I think, a huge uh, a tool that's going to kind of make its way into the tool belt of our, of our, um, our teachers. Uh, you know, you can use generative AI to analyze the uh, data of previous classes um, and generate different learning materials, generate different um, curriculum uh, 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 for the content that you're already providing. And you can do it in real time. So it can adapt to each student's needs. Um, you know, incorporating AI generated in, uh, assessments, um, uh, you, you can incorporate, sorry, AI generated assessments to align with your learning objectives. AI only does what you tell it to do. So if you give it your framework, it's going to kind of it's going to use that to kind of develop uh, to build out from there. Um, again, customizing those 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 assessments for different learning styles is going to be a huge tool. Um, we're going to be able to leverage AI to create more personalized online uh, personalized course outlines um, and lesson plans. It's all about personalization. It's all about making it making it uh, 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 more focused on student need. Kind of filling back to that idea of. Um, accessibility in education. Um, and it's going to be able to, AI already can, and, and it's going to get even better at being able to look at those individual strengths, weaknesses, and learning styles of our learners. Um, my hope is that we can start to use AI uh, for automated assessments um, as well in order to provide more immediate feedback um, and allow uh, uh, more timely interventions um, to enhance learning. Uh, uh, though AI does have built-in biases, um, you are, it, it, it's, it's, it shows promise to be less biased than, you know, our own, uh, our own selves. So something to keep in mind with that, um, with regards to, uh, more immersive learning experiences, um, you know, things like AR and VR, um, are, often powered by AI to create those more interactive and immersive learning experiences. So you can build out, or so you can use pre-built environments to explore, um, conduct simulations, uh, deepen understanding and enhance engagement. Um, and then kind of diving back into, you know, one of my areas of, of interest that universal you know, design for learning, you can curate, um, uh, for those that don't know, uh, for, for, we'll just get into it. Uh, so, when you're curating various means of representation, you know, your videos, your infographics, your other various resources to kind of meet the multiple means needs for universal design for learning, that can be challenging and time consuming for teachers. So rather than, um, you know, diving in, rather than using your time to do it, um, you have the, to, you, you, the, the opportunity is there to bring in an AI tool to help curate all that information. Um, and especially as AI develops even more, you know, a handful of months ago, uh, you know, AI really wasn't able to search and do all that curating for you. And now it can. So at the end of the day, we've already made leaps and bounds. So the idea, the hope here for me, at least, is that we can use this to help 
alleviate some of the um, stress and work that goes into developing those more universal learning, you know, universal design, universal design for learning um, uh, aspects and kind of put the work on the computers that are there to do the work for us and have done already. So at the end of the day, um, you know, I see AI as a rhyme of our past, right? Our calculators, our computers, and our internet. Um, and I really hope that we can focus more on um, uh, our approaches. Or what, what, sorry, what, what, I, what I think we need to do is refocus our approach uh, by continuing to adapt our traditional techniques, uh, our, measure, our traditional teaching methodology methodologies um, to, to use AI to design more personalized learning. Um, I don't see this, you know, at one point, um, granted, it was a talking head on the screen saying it was the end of, you know, the, the, the side that we, as we know, is the end of education as we know it. And obviously it's not the case. Uh, really, it's just the next chapter. It's the new frontier. Um, digital literacy really needs to be at the forefront. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we are uh, uh, approaching AI as a tool um, that people need to be trained on. Um, unfortunately, it's already made its way into the real world, so we're kind of catch, playing catch up, but we've been doing that for years, or we've been doing that for decades as it is with other technologies, so this is nothing new here. Um, uh, and we need to find ways to uh, uh, use this to help close that digital divide in a more in a, in a slow and responsible way, um, kind of leaning back to the fact that this was kind of thrown out into the world kind of abruptly in some cases, or to, to some extent, sorry. Um, at the end, uh, not to be too heavy handed, but this is something that, I, that, um, uh, I have used as kind of like a, um, motivator for me in the past. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the moment we become complacent and, uh, diametrically opposed to change, um, is the same moment that we become obsolete. So we don't want to fight against change because at the end of the day, nine times out of 10 change is going to win. And we're just going to be perked on the corner. So uh, that's the meat of my presentation. Um, I kind of want to open up more of a discussion for the rest of this. Um, kind of discuss what our thoughts are in regards to, um, you know, how we can use what we've learned in the past when it comes to how technology has disrupted our classrooms or even our, you know, our society to some extent in general. Um, and kind of use that as we kind of build out uh, in the future. So with that, I'm going to kind of roll it up to everybody here that's with us and kind of open up the, the session for discussion. Hi, can, can you hear me? Um, yeah, we got you. Yeah, so one question I have is regarding the applications that uses I. AI that we can use for education. Do you have any recommendations like for different, uh, let's say as a kinder uh, elementary, uh, do you have any recommendations of applications uh, for AI for middle school or high school? And um, and my second question is like, let's say the, a teacher is working on a, a specific topic and they ask students to to research about a specific topic. When they use AI, it's not the AI going to um, develop the same the same information about this the topic that the teacher researched and would that be contradictory in the classroom when it's time to expose this information with everybody else? Sure, those are really good questions. Let me just make a note of that second one so I don't lose it in my cluster of a mind. Uh, um, uh, uh, overlapping with, okay. So to the first one, in regards to like different applications uh, uh, that I would recommend, I don't want to um, uh, uh, I don't want to recommend any specific applications only because being an IT person, um, who works in, in higher education. I know what it's like when a faculty member or teacher is like, hey, I want to use this, so you need to show me how, to, or so we need to use this now. Um, I don't want to do that to anybody because it happens to me a lot. Um, but what I can say is 
um, with a lot of I, my focus mainly is on um, uh, uh, generative uh, AI or or uh, uh, large language models, um, in regards to how I kind of dive, dove into this topic. Um, but in that sense, um, kind of tying into your second question too a little bit, when we're looking at um, uh, 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 how AI might overlap or kind of, I don't want to say replace, um, but that, that, um, you know, teacher student interaction, um, uh, in regards to, you know, bringing in content and, and, and bringing in knowledge and kind of, um, uh, presenting that knowledge to the student. Um, uh, I agree that the, that our students for the most part have some access to the internet at any given time. Um, or at the very least, while walking into a library. So all that information, a student could go to the library or onto their phone and look up information about literally anything um, and have that. But I think part of what makes teaching so important is that it creates more context for the information um, and kind of building that out more and kind of bringing in more information. Um, so I would say that um, when we're talking about a, a, a topic, let's say, um, uh, 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 let's bring in, um, uh, for some reason, um, uh, the Civil War is on my mind because I'm doing a Universal Design for Learning webinar in a couple of days and, um, or seminar in a couple of days. And uh, I was, one of the, the my exercises is to, um, talk about different ways to bring that in. So, um, uh, but when we talk about the information that's available out there, so much out there um, on like let's let's actually let's move away from the Civil War. Let's look at um, the if, if, if classical music has any time or any place in today's society. Like what what classical music has um, done to to shape today's society. So students can go out there and look at all this information about classical uh, composers and different pieces and everything out there and how it's shaped music today. Um, but at the end of the day, the AI is still fairly robotic. It's not really going to um, bring that in a more in a meaningful way. And that's where we kind of as educators or those in the education field um, take that next step and bring in more meaning behind the, the information. I think that's where we're going to kind of fall back into um, into that role, bringing meaning, bringing context, bringing it all together um, into something more engaging and, 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 and interesting to students. Um, Leonard B says, thank you for sharing this information. I appreciate how you mentioned that the fact that we should be open to change and exploring new technologies. What would be a good starting point for educators to deep dive into AI and learn how to leverage it for instruction? And then I think we also have someone who wants to comment afterwards too. Randy has a suggestion afterwards. So one thing I would recommend looking at, um, and Randy, you can chime in too if, if, you, if, if, if I don't cover what you were going to say, is um, looking at um, learning how to um, uh, develop prompts for AI. Um, uh, there are a whole, there's a whole ton of information out there. Um, and there's even some like AI expert, like certifications you can get on designing and implement or designing, um, prompts for AI, uh, uh, in order to get the most information to get the best information out of it. That'd be a really good place to start or at the very least jumping in or, or even one step behind that, excuse me. And, um, uh, 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 going into Google's bar and just asking it questions, have it, you know, have a conversation. Um, honestly, I find it, you know, if, if I'm having, if, if, I mean, like, like, you know, today, obviously my, my, I guess my brain's a little fried today. Um, uh, uh, on days like that, I might go in and try and get AI to fall off its guardrails. Um, you know, AI has built in guardrails to make sure that it's not going to overly negatively affect the person that it's communicating with. Um, obviously, you know, there's ways around that and people have found ways around that. But one thing I think is very helpful is kind of learning what those guardrails are, what AI will and will not do for you, what it, what, you know, what questions it will answer and what, what it will say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. 
um you know i'm sorry i i you know going back to um uh the idea of um in a more responsible way um uh and you can also look at um regards to those limitations you can tr try to get it to um I mean, one thing I did for uh, one of the course that, I, that, I, that I'm teaching at Rutgers is I went through and I um, asked AI to answer all the questions for um, one of my uh, uh, last quizzes, which was a take home quiz, all the short answer uh, uh, questions. And um, just to see what I might need to do to reword it so I can get more, so, so I can find ways to, so that, that my students are thinking more critically than what AI can do. So that might be a really good way to do it too, is try and find ways to um, trick it almost into um, uh, 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 not being able to give all the information about that, that and, and having students do some of that work too. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Randy, did you have something else? No, I, well, you hit the nail on the head. Um, hi everybody, Randy Narvaez here. Uh, I'm an assistant principal in Edison and also part of uh, NJCU's cohort 10. Um, I actually had, um, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of months to lead a series of workshops with my teachers um, on AI and leveraging AI for um, instruction. And so um, I would say that exactly what you said, Jeff, um, in terms of exploring prompt engineering. And I gave um, a, a I gave my teachers a framework that I actually stole from someone else. It's not mine, so I can't take credit for it, but it's called the PREP edit framework. And um, PREP stands for um, prompt role explicit parameters. And basically um, when you use that framework, it helps you come up with the best prompts that you can come up with for that particular uh, task. So like introducing the prompt with a question, giving it a role or vo voice or like, I'm a third grade teacher, um, that, that sort of thing. And then the edit framework is, okay, now the machine is going to spit something out, right? It's gonna give you what you've asked it to do, but it's not going to be perfect. And so how you can go back and evaluate what the machine is giving you that output and determining, okay, is this accurate? Do I need something a little bit different? Identifying any biases or um, misinformation in the output and then using that to come up with another prompt to hopefully transform what it is that was um, provided. So I would say exploring a framework like that just so that you're familiar with how you can make your prompting stronger because when your prompting is stronger, what it produces is going to be stronger. And then the second piece that I'll add to that is you really just have to think about what it is that you need, right? So you might need uh, support with scaffolds for certain students. So in your prompting, you're going to make sure that you say like, I, you know, that you need uh, scaffolds for ELLs with this specific reading uh, skill um, or you know, you might need help developing learning targets that are aligned to specific standards or breaking specific standards up. Um, so what what my teachers have really, you know, come to uh, or learn from from some of these workshops is they're saying, Randy, the better my prompting um, is, the better output that I get, the more aligned it is. Um, they've actually developed um, essentially prompt uh, skeletons, if you will, that they can just sort of plug in different content or different um, information into these generic prompts that they've created. And, you know, they're raving about the amount of time that it's been able to save them and, um, you know, how it's been able to open up more time for other things that we need to do as educators. So I would say the two, my two pieces of advice are definitely think about what it is that the AI tool can help you with. And then also um, using uh, a specific framework. And then the last piece, I guess I'll say is like, we've, you know, every school and district has a philosophy about, you know, what makes good math instruction or good ELA instruction or whatever, whatever content area. And there is, you know, uh, hopefully it's backed by research and frameworks of, of its own, but incorporating that into your prompting as well, right? So if you if you are using um, 
this to help you create some think alouds for uh, a reading lesson, um, you want to make sure that when you're prompting, when you're creating that prompt, you are, you know, using terms like help me with a gradual release model where I'm, you know, modeling first and then I'm um, giving students the opportunity to practice in whole group or in small group. So being the uh, the most specific that you can be. And I think that means that we're not like throwing the baby out with the bathwater and uh, just saying, oh, well, I know we used to use this curriculum or we used to use this guide, but like now we have this tool. I think integrating everything and every resource that you have into um, into the AI will produce something much better. Yeah, that's for it. Sure. For sure. No, that, those are some really great points. Um, uh, you know, I have used, you know, kind of going back to one, one of my earlier slides, I've used situation, I, I've had situations where I've just been um, just not kind of hit a wall of trying to find, um, uh, 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 trying to trying to figure out how to create a more, you know, universally designed um, uh, lesson plan on um, something within IT accessibility, which is ironic, but anyway. Uh, and uh, I ended up jumping into uh, chat GPT and saying, hey, uh, I'm, you know, I am teaching a course in higher ed. It is on IT accessibility and I need, and can you help me um, curate a, uh, a some other means of representation for this topic? And it was able to reach out to, um, uh, 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 into Bing because this is their teamed up with Bing now to pull in some search results and some ideas and kind of help curate that information. Um, and I was I was transparent with my classes like, hey, you know, I, I brought the, all these things came in from AI. You know, just to keep in mind that like these are these are tools we can use as long as we use them appropriately. Um, uh, uh, there was one thing that was brought up that I wanted to, um, yeah, uh, Sherry, you made a really good point on on. Um, how you know students can use it too, having your students you know submit the prompt they use and then have to verify you know the response from AI. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that I'm I'm doing this semester in in that course is I'm going to have the students um, kind of uh, 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 to kind of learn you know the ins outs a little bit of AI and its accessibility and its lack of in some cases. Um, uh, uh, so like submit a prompt to AI to, to ChatGPT, um, submit it to the discussion board and kind of tear it apart, kind of break it down and figure out where it failed and where it succeeded and where it failed. Um, you know, those are ways you can help teach that digital literacy um, and show the pros and cons and, and where AI can be helpful and where it's going to fail until somebody fixes that bug, but something else is going to break later. Um, you know, so I think that that's a really, um, I think that that was one of the ones I really appreciated in, in chat. Um, so I just wanted to call that one out. Um, we have another question, I think from, I'm not sure if I'm saying the name right, um, Shanjisha. And um, this is, I know other sessions are also going to spend a lot of time on on more of the uh, mechanics as well, but her question, or maybe his question, uh, their question, can you please show us a bit about how AI is being used in the classroom, for example, to use as a classroom, uh, use us as a classroom and do something with AI and teach us how to do that? Um, like, like you said, this is like the, the, the actual me jumping into AI, I think is going to be covered later on in the week. Um, so I don't want to go too far into that, but, you know, you know, like I said, my example of, you know, asking AI using that, that, that framework to prompt it to say, show, you know, build this out for me. And then like Randy said, um, you know, going back in and editing your prompt or saying, you know, no, my prompt was good, but you were way off base. Um, you know, and, and. Uh, frankly, I mean, and you know, I'm, uh, if you aren't aware, um, uh, we are the guinea pigs by using it. So when we tell, uh, you know, Bard or ChatGPT or, or what have you that the response was not good, it stores that information to some extent, and it's used to help kind of fix it later down the road. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're using it when it comes to like data privacy and that as well. Um, uh, and then depending on if you're using a free or paid version, there's other features you can get as well. Um, but always keeping in mind data security. Uh, but, uh, um, there's another question uh, uh, from Trista. 
where do we find the intersection between using AI and prepping students for standardized testing? Uh, teaching them to use these tools is vital for their success in navigating the technological world, but with the emphasis on test scores and education, how do we navigate this particular issue? I mean, that's going to be tricky. Uh, uh, that's that, that's a, a, a really tricky question. Um, let me think about this for a second. So I think when it comes down to, um, uh, you know, prepping for those standardized tests, I mean, um, obviously we need to find a way to assess the knowledge that our students are, get, are getting um, and to make sure that it is their knowledge. Um, you know, yeah. you know, tests are never going to go away. Standardized tests are likely never going to go away. Um, I don't know if I have a perfect answer for that. I think in my mind, the best way would be, you know, um, the same way we've used um, something like, uh, I mean, the internet in general, right? You know, we've brought that into our classroom um, and uh, it has changed how knowledge is, is received, how knowledge is found. Um, uh, I mean, things like YouTube and podcasts has changed how knowledge is, is how how content is, is digested. Um, so I would say that you know, it, it, it's. I th I feel like um, uh, uh, testing is going to kind of be that linchpin that keeps us from going too far off the rails and letting us just sit back and and work eight hours a day and let AI do the rest for us. Um, so I think that that's kind of how I square that circle, and that you know we're going to need to bring AI into the classroom. Like I said, it's going to be needed. You, you, we're going to need to make sure that our, our students know how, how to live in a world where AI is part of it now, even more so than it may have been before. Um, you know, uh, uh, so, oh, this is one that I didn't put in my size, but I mean, to some extent, the spell checker and the grammar checker in Microsoft Word is a version of AI, right? And we still expect our students to be able to draft a paragraph without all those tools. So we've already done it once before. So we're just gonna have to kind of adjust what we've done in the past to still make sure that that um, knowledge, that ability is still there with the understanding that these tools are gonna be there to help us anyway. I say that at the time, at the same time, seeing red squigglies on my notes because I can't spell, but that's beside the point. <laughs> um, so it's something to just, I guess, I guess that's kind of my answer to that question. I'll, as a K-12 like administrator, I'll I'll add to everything you're saying, Jeff. I'll just say like in terms of standardized testing, uh, obviously we never want to teach to a test or anything like that. But if we do start with the end in mind, like there are clear examples, at least in New Jersey, of um, like there are sample release items on New Jersey Department of Education's website where they show like this is what a uh, rubric of uh, a four on the rubric looks like in terms of an actual student response. We can leverage AI to help break that down into like concrete skills that we can teach kids. For example, um, and this, this is coming from someone who, uh, you know, one of my teachers who said, I was able to take exemplar, student exemplar responses and break it down to explicit skills like okay, I need to teach kids how to write strong topic sentences when they're responding to a prompt like this. I need to make sure all th that I teach them how to cite textual evidence, like break it down into the skills that they need. So if we're starting from the end in mind, okay, what do kids need to be able to do? Um, so looking at the standards for instruction, AI can help us break those standards down. AI can help us create objectives that are aligned to those standards. AI can help us uh, come up with models or exemplar responses for those standards. So there's a there's a ton that you can do as long as you are sorry that's my dog. As long as you're working backwards from um, from what kids need to be able to to do. That's a, that's a really great point too. And I mean, you know, like you said, you you know, AI can help um, do some of the heavy lifting for you know figuring out you know what are some you know, you know, looking at real world situations, what are some learning objectives that are relevant in the real world on this topic? And then you can go one step further. Okay, these are my learning objectives. You know, you already given me these learning objectives. Okay, can you help me design a um, uh, uh, 
a, a quiz or an assessment that that follows these learning objectives. So now I know how where I want to go, and then kind of use that, like you said, kind of work backwards. Say, you know, you're not necessarily, you, you know, to some extent, you're teaching to do a test, but you're teaching to what you expect your students to know after the fact as well. So as you build out, um, you know, your your prompts and your responses to those prompts, um, you can AI theoretically can help um kind of help build that foundation to kind of build up from there too so it's can be kind of yeah like you said it's, it's you know figuring out what the end goal is and kind of working back and then also kind of starting with the here are my learning objectives and then moving forward and kind of find that middle that middle point together okay we have another question um vanessa asks do you think ai can assist into professional development so i think that that um uh I'm going to answer the question this way, and Vanessa, you can you can check me if I'm not going where you want. Um, uh, so, in regards to can it help to develop professional development, uh, which obviously it can, it can help to develop really whatever you want it as long as you give it it's 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 uh, what you, it's what you expect from it. Um, what I would say though is that um, uh, it uh, is going to um, it. it there, some of the guardrails that are built into AI is that it it doesn't kind of um it 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 how am I gonna work this one it um won't necessarily it won't show you how to break it you kind of have to do that on your own so there are some things that AI will be able to do for you but there are some things you have to do your own work for to kind of build up the rest of that professional development. Um, uh, it'll never replace the person doing the work, but it will help alleviate some of these, some of the, uh, the processes involved, some of the, um, the repetitive things that the repetitive nature of life, um, and of, of developing stuff, it can kind of do some of that for us. So hopefully that answers your question. You know, Jeff, uh, when you spoke about how, uh, you know, in, in your topic, you, you said, how AI should be balancing education. I fear and, and you know, comment on this. Um, I am always at administrator meetings and I ask the superintendents, you know, around the US, you know, what's happening in these schools on why there's so many dropout rates. And these schools have been trying to open up career academies, like, you know, bringing back uh, how to work on a car, nail techs, you know, how to do hair, waxing, all that stuff. Because we ask these students, you know, why are you dropping out? And this is their interest. Like it's a hands-on approach. So I'm just curious when this happens in the future, it, are, are we going to have AI to help out with these hands-on tools? Like a, a example, um, you know, I was talking to one of my students about, and she loves you know, doing nails and everything. And she said to me, she goes, well, I'm not going to need, need to know this because robots are going to have my job. And I don't want them having that fear. You know, maybe an AI robot can like create the perfect nail design, but then we still need these students to have hands-on approach. So what's your take on that? Like, you know, what have you been researching? What do you think is going to happen here? Let me look at my crystal ball. No, um, so I think at the end, I, I think you make a really valid point. I, th I think that the the I guess the fear that AI is going to take over for everything is is not unfounded necessarily. I think that that's a a, a fair question to ask. Like, um, uh, 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 but I think, uh, but but in that same breath, I will say that, uh, uh like you said, AI can can uh do a lot it can it can it can create to some extent it can create um but it's creating off of everybody else's creation so my answer to that student would be sure ai can you know create make this phenomenal design of nail work or of nail art or it can um a machine might be able to to put together or might be able to if not cut out and at some point in in the future put together a beautiful set for a a, a a play um but it's based on what somebody else already did 
it's not making the stuff on its own. It's based on everybody else's skills and knowledge and 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 eyes um, uh, and vision. So um, yes, AI will be able to do some. May, might be able to do some of that manual stuff, but they're not going to have your vision. It never will. Um, AI's vision is the amalgamation of a thousand other people's vision, but that's not your vision. So that's that's the answer that I know. That that's my somewhat generic answer is that at the end of the day, it will. Um, uh, you know, even uh, um, at, at the end of the day, human uh, intellect, human vision is likely never going to be replaced. Um, I don't think. Uh, but you know, I mean, like Sherry says, never say never. Uh, I, 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 um, I don't. I, I try to avoid having that. Um, ultimate cutoff of like well i'm just gonna sit at home because um ai will be able to answer all these questions you know in a in a in a voice that is um you know written voice that is is um equal or better than mine i mean it might be but it's still not my voice so jeff thank you good feedback thanks anybody mm -hmm. else have any questions All right. So if no one else has any questions. Jeff, thank you so much for this wonderful session today. We, we've we learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. All right. And everyone, again, you can uh, view this session again as this was being recorded, and it will be up in a couple of days on our YouTube channel. All right. Okay, everyone. So thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. I also put the link in the chat if you'd like to sign up for more sessions covering different topics and different types of content as well with other hands-on things to complement. So please let us know if you have any questions. Thanks again.